This story begins with my death. Or at least it starts in a situation where I thought I was going to die. Obviously I didn't, or else she wouldn't be reading this right now. It starts on Kestis IV, a small reddish-brown planet known for its ore-rich soil in the Kestis binary system. It starts with a trade war against the Palani. It starts with me on the ground, holding my own organs in, and praying to Nera for a faster death. I had been on K4 for almost 8 standard months, 2.3 Earth months EA. I was assigned to the resource protection force for the planet. My people, the Rune, had been on this world for nearly 50 cycles, around 72 Earth years, and had a mutual non-hostility pact with the Palani. But conflict had always been only a single mistake away. At least that was what the force commander had said during our welcome briefing. It seemed like an easy enough job. At least it was easier than the farming I would have been destined for had I not joined the Rune Armed Forces. I got my five meals a day for free, had my own habitation dome, and my military physical training had caused enough of a pigmentation shift for me to become more attractive to potential mates. And there were plenty of them in both the mining community and the garrison forces. Sure, I wasn't getting paid much, but I was young and having a good time. Too bad that didn't last. It started almost four months after I got there. I don't know what sparked it. My sector leader told us that one of the other mines had dug into Palani held territory. It doesn't really matter. All it meant was that the planet was now in a state of war. The good times were over. Our mine, and as a result our defensive base, came under attack two months later. Nothing special at first. A few enemy snipers took up position outside our walls. A few of our people got hit. One of them killed outright and we raised our walls and practiced defensive maneuvers. These consisted of routine patrols and wearing our full deflective armor any time we weren't inside a reinforced building. It did eventually escalate. After another month, the Palani forces had finally made their way close enough to us to begin sending small raids. We weren't the primary target, we were a target of opportunity. Their real target was our planetary trade headquarters. This, however, was still bad for us, as they were only 20 miles away. Eventually, these raids transitioned to full on battles. The first full blown battle was almost too easy. It lasted nearly a day, but at no point did it seem like we were being pressed. The Palani Rangers attacked from a distance, utilizing long range rifle attacks and armored vehicular strikes. Our defensive interceptor network kept the truly dangerous rounds from impacting, the missiles and heavy plasma shots fizzing in mid air before impacting on our walls. But the rifles claimed more than a few of my comrades. After losing several vehicles and more than a few of their men to our defences, the enemy withdrew. It was an easy fight. I felt good. If this was combat, then how could I be worried? How foolish I was. The raids that had been sent ahead before were actually scouting parties. They were only meant to test us and see what our defences were capable of. The first real battle was meant to confirm that intel and see if we had any heavy armaments or defensive capabilities the raids hadn't found. Two days later, the real first true battle commenced. The raids had only consisted of 20 or so Polani rangers and maybe a vehicle or two. The first battle, the one meant to test us, had consisted of maybe 100 enemy rangers and at least 20 vehicles, several of which had been heavier anti-armor vehicles. This new attack saw well over a thousand enemy rangers and so many vehicles that each of those rangers could have had one of their own. I had been scared during the first raid. It had been my first combat experience after all, and also during the test battle. Now, I was terrified. The interceptor network was straining. Enemy heavy weapons attacks were using up all its defensive ability. Even then, some were slipping through and impacting the walls and other parts of the base. 20 or so meters away, an enemy shell slipped past the network and vaporized several of my comrades on top section of the wall. The blast was large enough to knock me onto my secondary knees. I looked over to see what had happened and witnessed the fiery carnage. Krelk, a friend of mine from when we were in training, had been assigned to that section. I never saw him again. He'd been in that blast, but I wouldn't find that out until much later. After a moment of sadness, an enemy round, only a rifle round, Ricocheted off the tower wall nearby and impacted my armor. It wasn't enough to get through, but it still stung. It snapped me back to the fight at hand. I reshouldered my rifle and began firing back again. I honestly don't even know if I hit anything I aimed at. 
I saw movement. I aimed my coiler at it and fired. It was all just muscle memory from training and the previous fights. But honestly, the rest of the fight became a haze. I remember the interceptor network failing. A small antenna, each placed every 10 meters on the wall, burning out one at a time. They popped and smelled like ozone when they did. I remember the enemy focusing their fire on the areas where they failed. I remember the one only a few paces away from me following suit. I remember my sector leader grabbing my shoulder and throwing me off the wall. I remember falling the five or so meters to the ground, confused as to why he'd attacked me. I remember the heat, as the explosion destroyed the location I'd just been. There's a small gap after that. I assume that I was knocked out, whether from the fall or the explosion. I don't know. One of the other sector leaders was leading a last offence, as the wall had finally caved nearby. One of her shoulders was shaking me awake, asking me questions, pushing her rifle into my hands and pulling me up to my feet. I remember staggering over to where the other people were forming up. I don't remember being hit. One second I'd been walking, just trying to stay upright, heading towards them. Then something knocked me to the ground. It didn't hurt. It felt like there was ice in my chest. I was face down. I went back up when I felt heat passing over my back, close enough to feel like I was being scorched. I coughed out some of the rusty brown dirt. That was when the pain kicked in. I pushed myself up. It took everything I had. That was a mistake. The second I did, I began to fall apart. My middle intestines, not that I knew that was what they were, poured out of the hole in the front of my chest. I didn't understand. That wasn't supposed to happen. Then I noticed the blood pouring out, the bright orange making the ground a sickly light brown colour that reminded me far too much of the gravy in our breakfast rations. I clapped my hands over them, trying to hold them in, and looked up. My fellow soldiers were fighting, but it was a fight they weren't going to win. As I watched, they began pulling back, they were being picked apart. An enemy vehicle had come through the hole of the wall, hovering over the debris easily, and began to make the toll worse. My comrades, few as they now were, were leaving me. I couldn't blame them either. This fight was a lost cause. I sat there on the ground, feebly holding myself together as the enemy continued approaching. As they neared me, I realized what an easy target I must be. I laid back down, still trying to hold everything in, and stayed as still as I could. The Polani continued advancing, firing at who knows what. When they eventually reached my position, I played dead. It may be a cowardly thing to do, but I was unarmed and dying. Whatever course of action was there? Eventually, one of them walked over to me and kicked me over onto my back to check if I was still alive. Inside my head, I was screaming. My intestines stayed where they were, and I left them there as I rolled. I landed on my back, and it took every ounce of willpower I had not to begin crying, or screaming, or both. Apparently it worked. The Palani looked at my wound, looked up at my face, spat at me, laughed, and then he began walking away. Maybe I fooled him, or maybe he simply knew that it didn't matter if I was alive or not. After he left, after the rest of them had left, I broke down crying. I don't know how long I was there. I pulled myself back together, futile as it was, and sobbed. I cried until my ears rang out at the small blue droplets. I still tried to save myself as I sat there. I pulled out my aid kit, simple as it was, and took almost every pill in it. One was to enhance my clotting factor, one to dull the pain, one to help me produce more blood, and one was to help avoid infection. I doubted any of them would be enough. How could they be? I did, however, begin feeling better almost immediately. Not enough, though. I passed out again. I don't know how long I was there, but when I woke up, I was no longer on the battlefield. At first, I thought I must have died. I was lying in a very oddly small bed. It had white and blue linens that were thin, but comfortably warm. The walls were white sheets held up by shiny metal rods. My skin had lost any pigment that my training had once earned it. There was no hole in my chest. If my memory of childhood temple classes was worth anything, I knew I must be a nearest hearth. And then an odd beeping noise broke the illusion. That was when I noticed the wires leading from my upper leg to an odd bog-shaped device attached to a tall wheel platform. That box was what had made the beep, I was sure of it. I also noticed the weird clothes I was in. They were an odd green colour and had elastic bands holding the pants up. 
The pants were also very short, barely reaching my primary knee before they ended. As I inspected the shirt, I noticed a bandage wrapping on my chest. I pulled the shirt off a little to look under it. I had a wad or swathe of cloth bandaging all over my chest, a lightly stained orange in some areas, and when I poked them, I felt a deep ache in my chest. It was at this point that another creature walked in. I scurried up the back of the bed to try and make myself bigger and prep for whatever attack it might try. But as I did, my chest reminded me of what had happened. I almost passed out again. Whoa there, big guy! It exclaimed as it jumped forward with his hands out. It wasn't trying to attack. Instead, it grabbed my left shoulder and stared at me as I slid back down to my previous position. I felt woozy. You can't be moving around that much, man. You only barely made it through surgery. It's going to be a while before you're mobile. Surgery, I thought. What a nearest world is surgery. It seemed to pick up on the confusion I was feeling. How, I don't know. Our faces were nothing alike. You're probably wondering how you can understand me around now. It pointed to its forehead. It's because of the neural interpreter we put on you while you were out. Its forehead was bare, so I reached up to touch mine. A small band of metal rested on it. Standard procedure for species we haven't had enough contact with to share a language. I pulled the band off my forehead, and immediately the creature's words became a bunch of unintelligible blubbering noises. I put it back on, and it went back to being my own language. Pretty nifty, huh? It said with his teeth showing. What is nifty? Who are you? Where am I? I thought I was dead, I asked. I had more questions. A lot more questions. I'm Dr. Michael Rico. You're on the UTN medical ship segment. And let me tell you, you were pretty damn close to dead all right. He pulled up a piece of plastic with some compressed fiber sheets on it. When the medics found you, they weren't even capable of waking you up. Medics? The creature continued speaking. You had eight broken ribs, two fractured vertebrae, a pretty severe concussion, you were disemboweled, and by God you had lost a lot of blood. It looked up at me. His face shifted. Honestly, your survival is nothing short of a miracle, my friend. I am not your friend. I don't even know what a doctor is. What do all of those words even mean? What even is a concussion? I asked. I was frustrated and confused. Half of the words this doctor had just said weren't even words. It shifted. It seemed uncomfortable. Right, they warned us about this. It paused. I think it was thinking. Your species doesn't have medicine, does it? It made some weird gesture with his hands when it said the words medicine. It was staring at me. Its eyes discomforted me. His species had obviously descended from predators at some point. We have medicine. It is what you give to the sick. If they get better, then they can rejoin society. If not, then it makes their passing less painful, I answered. His face seemed to scrunch up. The two tufts of hair above his eyes moved closer together. It brought his hands together and laced the fingers. I noticed that his hands were actually remarkably similar to mine, albeit smaller. He spoke again. That's a very archaic concept of medicine. Tell me, what do you do if you're injured? What happens if someone breaks a bone or, like you, gets very badly wounded? We have things to help with that. We have pills and bandages, as you do, but it is expected that the person who sustained the injury should treat it. His face had an odd expression I would learn later, that it was confused. That is why I thought I was dead. I knew my injuries were too great to survive. Okay, that is kind of fucked up, he said while looking down. His eyes were glazed over. I do not know what a fucked was. That's not how we think. Do you know what a human is? I have heard of them. They are new to the galactic scene. I do not know much more than that, though. He was moving his head up and down. I was just a soldier. A relatively new soldier with that. I do not know too much outside of that. That base was my first duty station. Well, my friend. It was still calling me friend. You've just met your first human. Because I am one. It began to pull at the wall of cloth. We have a slightly different approach to medicine. I had expected the cloth walls to be hiding the outdoors. I had been in plenty of tents before, and these seemed similar enough. I was only mildly surprised to find that we were in a room. I was more surprised that that room's far wall was a large window that showed my entire planet. We were in orbit, but the most surprising thing was that we weren't alone in the room. The room had 20 other beds just like mine. Each of them was occupied. 
Some had my fellow soldiers, ones that I even recognised. Others had members of species I had never seen before. A handful of the beds had other doctors, or at least they were dressed like this doctor before me. All of them were bandaged to some level. One of them was missing both his legs. They were heavily bandaged. How would it survive being crippled that badly? It didn't even occur to me that it was a different species. I didn't even know if those were his legs. I know it's a little much, the doctor said. I'd honestly forgotten he was there. Especially for a guy that just woke up after a pretty intense surgery. It began walking to another bed. That is what we do, been doing it forever. Even on creatures that aren't considered sapient. It began talking to the creature in the bed. It was near now. I was aboard the Sekhmet for another four months. It took me a long time to recover from my injuries. But also I was partly just curious about these humans and their concept of medicine. It turns out that humans believe in a concept of no man left behind, wherein they do not leave their injured to fend for themselves. Their medics were a cast of warrior doctors willing to wade into hostile situations, be they dangerous weather or terrain conditions, or actual combat zones to tend to the wounded. The notion was entirely foreign to me. That was another thing though. Doctors. I came to learn what this word meant. It meant a person whose sole purpose in life, their profession, their passion, their career, was to heal. Not just the sick, but the injured, and the mentally sick as well. Completely opposite to the mentality of the healers of my people, those who viewed the sick as burdens, and the injured as lazy. I got a chance to see the human medics at work. I was allowed in a command centre that the humans called Dispatch, where I was able to watch a feed showing the human crew at work. The ship had taken position over a planet that was currently being subjugated to severe tectonic activity. They hailed the planet's government and requested permission to lend aid. Permission was granted and human dropships began descending into the atmosphere. I watched as these ships dropped humans into areas that were flooded, onto buildings that were on fire, into areas with dangerous gases, places still shaking from the quakes. The humans ran into the danger and saved people. When the people they rescued were injured, they healed them. I do not know how the humans did it. Some of the people they say were completely alien in their biology. They simply scanned the injured and then pulled out the correct supplies every time. They used resources to keep them alive and heal them. Resources that I used to think were wasted. But I was wrong. My species was foolish. We thought the injured were a waste of resources and time. We thought that if you were strong enough, you would save yourself. So wasteful. I felt so ashamed when I saw the benefits of human medicine. I saw parents rejoice as their children were saved. I saw bonded pairs hold each other with tenderness and love after being reunited. I saw the fearful relieved after seemingly mortal wounds were healed. I saw once proud soldiers and athletes given a second chance at their livelihood. I saw people given hope. Once I was healed I made a request of the human crew. I wanted to learn to heal people like they did. I wanted to help them in their mission. And once I was ready, once I had learned enough, I wanted to go back to my people and show them the error of our ways. I asked this of Dr. Rico. He smiled and walked me to a room I had not yet been to. When I saw what was inside, I was amazed. I saw people of all kinds, species I had never seen before, not even in my time on the ship. They were practicing different medical interventions on dummies of all different kinds, interventions that I had witnessed before in the different medical bays and on the dispatch video feeds. Some were practicing different methods of navigating hazardous terrain in holographic training areas. Human crew members were walking throughout the room giving instruction. These people were learning to be like the human medics, nurses and doctors that I have been interacting with. My friend, Dr. Rico said next to me. I'd managed to forget he was there, again. Ready to go to class? Where and what is class? I thought to myself.